Olá, seja bem-vindo ao nosso canal. Hoje nós estamos aqui com o Coronel Philip, que é do Corpo de Fuzileiros Navais dos Estados Unidos. Ele tem uma vasta experiência militar, esteve na Guerra do Iraque e hoje trabalha junto com a AMCF, que é uma associação internacional de militares cristãos. Olá, Coronel, seja bem-vindo. Obrigado por estar aqui. Não, de nada. <risos> Bom, Coronel, eu queria começar a nossa entrevista sabendo que o senhor falasse um pouquinho da AMCF, que ela começou com uma comunhão entre militares. E eu queria que o senhor falasse um pouquinho desse trabalho. The idea of the AMCF, the Association of Military Christian Fellowships, goes back more than 150 years. It started in 1851 when a British soldier, Captain Trotter, was stationed in Afghanistan. He felt very alone, he had no Christian fellowship, and so he wrote back to England and asked people to pray for him that he would find fellowship and that he would not sense himself being alone. And from that grew a fellowship that went not only from Afghanistan, but throughout the British Army. And later, by 1920, this was not just the Army, but the Army and the Navy in the UK. It continued to grow, and by 1930, there were actually four countries that had military Christian fellowships. It was not run by the chaplains or the churches, it was run by military people, military men and women, who said, we have got to find fellowship because many times we're isolated. We don't have churches or chaplains, and so we need to learn how to study God's word and to grow. And so there were four countries that had fellowships in 1930. And after World War II was over, it, it grew a bit. In fact, by 1972, there were 12 countries that had agreed to come together and associate and the head of the United States Fellowship, which is called Officers Christian Fellowship, he decided to leave that job and start the, our organization, which is ACTS, the Association for Christian Conferences, Teaching and Service. He said, well, why should we just do this in our country? We should do this around the world. And since 1972, the number of countries that have military Christian fellowships has grown from just 12 today to over 140. And so what we see here in Brazil, we see in many other countries. And it falls under the Association of Military Christian Fellowships. The Association of Military Christian Fellowships is not an organization. It doesn't have authority. It doesn't tell the military fellowships what to do. But it's a place where they can come to share in their problems, to pray together, to be encouraged, to learn from one another, and to share their experiences and to work together to build each other up. So it's very, very important, especially in countries where there's much more persecution. Today, the Association for Military Christian Fellowships is organized so that there is a world president, he is a four-star general from Sri Lanka today, and there are 14 different regions around the world. Each one of these regions has a, a vice president. And the vice president of the AMCF for that region visits all the countries to try to find out how can they help out to encourage or to build them up. But the president and these vice presidents, they have no office, no budget, no money, no staff. And so ACTS, our organization, mm -hmm. Association for Christian Conferences, Teaching and Service, we have two partners. One is in UK, one is in Korea. And the three of us together reach out to provide the resources, the training, and the help that the AMCF needs. And so we work today in over 100 countries to do teaching, conferences, services, and many other things. Mm -hmm. Now I know that what I just said sounds like alphabet soup But really, our mission is very, very simple. Our vision is that everyone who wears a uniform for their country hears the gospel and sees it lived out by someone in their own uniform, not by a foreign missionary, but by someone who's in 
their army or in their military police because then it, it becomes real for them. And so, although it sounds complicated, the mission is very simple. We want to see the gospel spread throughout the whole world through the military of the world. Então, essa é uma missão, mas também tem o um lado de salvar a vida das pessoas, de uma missão de salvar vidas. Uh, that may be the most important part of what the MCF does. Because even if it did nothing for the country, it does much, but even if it did nothing else, it means that some people who are in the military will come to know Jesus Christ and they will be saved forever. I had a friend who uh, was in the Coast Guard. His job was to save lives. He would flew helicopters and he would pull people out and rescue them. And he was my classmate at flight school. And I was flying Marine Corps helicopters. My mission was to fly the soldiers in, fly the Marines into combat. His job was to save lives. And I was at his house and I was complaining because I didn't get a chance to go and save lives. I was just flying Marines. And he very patiently listened to me complain. But when I was done complaining, he just smiled. And behind him in his house, I noticed there was a plaque. And I went up and read the first plaque. It was a life-saving award for rescuing six sailors off a boat that overturned in a storm. Six lives. And next to it was another plaque for saving 30 sailors off a ship that was sinking. And he had more plaques. And as I read the plaques, I got more and more depressed. Oh, he did so many good things. And he smiled and he asked me, Phil, how many people's lives do you have to save before you feel your career was not a waste? I said, Mm, I think maybe one, <laughs> because yes, just one. But everybody he saved will die again. How much more important to bring eternal life if there were just one person that got saved? It would be worth everything because it would be for eternity and they will never die in Christ. And so the other thing that the MCF does is it encourages others that are in the military it helps them find Jesus Christ. It helps them to share their faith. And through that, it's having an eternal difference because kingdoms will come and go. Countries will stand and fall. But God's word abides forever. And those that are saved in him will be saved forever, which is another reason to be thankful for the military Christian fellowships. And may God bless those that are in them to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Coronel. E o Brasil? Como o senhor vê nesse contexto? Qual a importância do Brasil nesse campo missionário? Well, we love to come to Brazil. Brazil is very exciting because Brazil has the largest military Christian fellowship in the whole world. There are over 100,000, way over 100,000 military police and soldiers and sailors and airmen in the MCF of Brazil. And because of its size, and because of its connection, it is an example and a model for other military Christian fellowships. They look at Brazil's fellowship and say, for examples of how they can organize and what activities they can do. And in Brazil, in all the states, there are military fellowships. And these fall under the national fellowship of UMSEBI. And they gather together every two years, which is an encouragement but they also work together in between and they can uh, encourage one another and they can learn from one another. The MCF in Brazil has also a very good relationship with the chaplains and it's getting better all the time, which is a great encouragement. And it has been hard in the past, but we believe that we see progress today between the cooperation between the military Christian fellowship, which is the soldiers and the chaplains, who are organized in the state. There's also excellent cooperation with many churches because the churches see why the military is so important. In some places, people say, well, 
can a Christian serve in the military? Why should I, why should I care about the military? But it's very important to reach out to the military because even though the military are very, very small percentage of the people in the whole country, they have a, an enormous impact on the country itself. If the police and the military in the country are good, if they have integrity and honesty, then the people can live in peace. The people can live secure. But when there's corruption and when there's evil, then the people live in fear. And there's always a struggle. But because the MCF in Brazil is so strong, and there are so many Christians in so many different places, there's hope here that when something happens, that the military police and the army and the Navy and Air Force, that the people that are in charge will have a Christian influence. And so even if you never want to be in the military, you should pray for the military because they're the ones that set the tone for that, for the whole country. And uh, you have much to be thankful for here in Brazil. Now, whenever we come to a country, people will say, oh, my country has so many problems. Oh, we have the corruption and we have gangs and we have drugs and we have mm -hmm. politicians and we don't like. But it, when they look, at, everyone looks at themselves. They say, my country has got the worst problems. But I'll tell you, after visiting many, many, many countries, every, pro every country has the same challenges. Okay, because why? Because there's a struggle between good and evil in the world. Okay, and those that are pursuing good are always going to feel the opposition of the others. Mm -hmm. But the fact is there are many good things happening in this country. You have many leaders who want to follow Christ, who want to be good soldiers, who want to be good policemen, who want to be out there doing the right thing. And so you have much to be encouraged about here and the, as more and more people join the military fellowship, I think that it will become even better. Coronel, e o trabalho que o senhor tem de treinamento com líderes? A gente sabe que o senhor tem um treinamento muito legal de envolver treinamento de lideranças, de militares. Como que é esse trabalho? Fala um pouquinho para a gente. Well, we have several ways that we try to work to train leaders. Obviously, from our name. We do conferences, and you do conferences on leadership, on ethics, on how do I apply this within my military. We do it for senior people, and people actually throughout all levels of leadership. Even right now, there's a team that's in a country in the Far East, which is working with the generals in that country, who um, are getting some English training, but with a biblical perspective. And so we teach leadership at the highest levels. But we do much work with young people and cadets because they are the future. And so we have programs that reach out to the cadets at the academies in the different countries, but also through the staff, the, the sergeants, for the captains and the young officers, so that they learn, number one, that their career, their military career is calling from God. Some people say, oh, I was called to be a missionary or a pastor, but, but you're also called to be in the military. When you look at the Bible, you'll see that God looks upon the military with a special favor. It was a soldier who was the first one to say that Jesus was the Son of God. The first Gentile to receive the gospel was Cornelius, a soldier. And Jesus commanded the centurion. He said, I've never found this much faith in anyone else in Israel. And nowhere does he say, oh, you need to get out of the military. The military is a very, very special. And so it's important for us to work with those qualities the military has and to encourage them to become better. So we work with the cadets and say, your career is a calling from God. And if it's a calling from God, you need to integrate your faith into what you're doing. And by that, we mean you must become the most professional, the best soldier, the best policeman you possibly can, so that when your commander is thinking, who are my best leaders? 
the ones he should think of are the military Christians because they are being most like Christ, who is the perfect leader. Mm -hmm. They should be the ones who do their job best, who are conscientious, who take care of the men, who are honest. And so we want them to integrate their faith. And thirdly, we want them to meet with other Christians. And so we bring cadets down from the United States, from the military academies, and from other places where there are young leaders, and we invite them to meet the, for, the military Christians and the cadets in the other countries. And finally, we have another program where we will help them to come and do ac activities. And each of the activities will give a leadership lesson. We invite some people to come to the United States for two weeks in the summer where they do outdoor activities and mountain climbing and whitewater rafting and rappelling and things like that. And every activity they do has a, a leadership application. We do it in the United States. We also can export it so that the country can do it on their own without us. Because we don't want them to become dependent on us. We want each country to become strong mm -hmm. and be able to do their mission without somebody from the outside coming in. And so that's why we try to encourage them. So we do a lot of cadet things as well as for senior officers. Okay. E esse trabalho, a gente vê que trabalha de princípios. É só para cristãos, para evangélicos ou é para militares? That's a very good question. And sometimes when we go to approach a com commander, they'll say, is this just for Christian? But we approach it from an explicitly Christian perspective, but not exclusively Christian. And so many times we will have people who are not Christians who will become involved with our training. And that's good because we believe that the principles that are in the Bible are admired by everyone. They're good leadership principles. Sacrificial service, servant leadership, honesty, integrity, faithfulness. All of these things are, are good things that every leader wants to have. And so, yes, we teach it from a Christian perspective. We look to Christ as an example and we look at the Bible for lessons. But the lessons that you take out of this thing are good for all leaders. And many commanders, when they understand, they send their people and they, uh, they come back and say, I'm glad they went. Coronel, o senhor esteve no Iraque, tem uma vasta experiência militar. Eu queria que o senhor falasse para a gente como cristão, como militar cristão, como foi essa experiência para o senhor? Well, when I went to Iraq, I was, I was a senior officer. And so I did not have the same experience of direct, close threat that many of the young soldiers had. Um, I was on a base that uh, in Camp Fallujah, in Baghdad, and other places. And the enemy, they would shoot rockets at us, but you can't tell when a rocket's going to hit, so there's nothing to worry about. If you get killed, you get killed, no problem. And when uh, we would fly from a place to place in a helicopter, the electronics would tell if the missile was coming, and they would shoot off the flares, and uh, it was actually kind of pretty because it was like fireworks. And, uh, but there was nothing to worry about. You're killed or you're not killed. You have a complete sense of trust in God that you're in his hands. But I never had to face that particular threat. Now my job was, I was the director of the combat assessment team. Our job was to collect lessons learned and to find out how we were doing and how we could do better. One of the, part of that job, we would collect vehicles that had hit mines. And there was a, a big area where we kept them so we could study them and decide on how we could redesign the vehicles. And so I knew the threats. We saw casualties and we saw what happens when people got hit. But the real experience for me from combat was not mine, which was, I didn't worry about it. I was actually uh, okay. If I die, I die, because I knew where I was going. 
But my son was also in Iraq. He was a platoon commander that did convoys, and so he was always on the road every day. And I knew what he was facing. And it wasn't until I came back and I was safe and I saw my son and I knew how dangerous what he was doing was. And then it changed my whole idea about what God did for us. Because I did not want my son to be killed. Even more, I did not want him to be captured because I knew he would be treated terribly and tortured before he was killed. I wanted him to return. I wanted him to be healthy. I loved my son. And then I thought about God's sacrifice. God the Father sent his son. And he knew when he sent his son that his son would die, not just die, not just quick, but die a most horrible death at the hands of people that hated him. And he would die for people that did not appreciate the sacrifice. And yet he did it anyway. And as I worried about my son, I realized how it must have broken God the Father's heart to watch his son suffer rejection and become sin for all of us. And from that point on, it totally changed my life. I always loved Jesus. I could see Jesus' sacrifice. I never appreciated the Father's love for us in letting his son die for us. He loved his son. We were his enemies. But while we were still his enemies, God gave us his son and Jesus died for us. And that totally changed my life. So for me, my experience in combat was nothing. My, what I learned from my son was everything. And it has totally transformed the way I look now at my Heavenly Father. Coronel, o que, que o senhor tem de expectativa para o Brasil? Nos próximos meses, nos próximos anos? It's very exciting things are happening in Brazil. Uh, next year, I know that Sao Paulo is preparing to host the convention of all of the military police and military fellowships in Brazil. All, all 27 states will be here in Sao Paulo. Normally there are about a thousand people that come together, a thousand military police, Army, Navy, Air Force. And so we're very excited about this because next year we'll have a, a, a national convention. But even more so, there's a, a possibility that in a few years, uh, Brazil might offer to host the World Conference. At the World Conference, we bring military Christian fellowships from every country that has them. And they come together in one place for encouragement and for teaching and for fellowship and for sharing. Uh, there was one in South Africa where 86 countries military came together. And uh, there was another one in Korea, 134 countries. And there is nothing like, like hearing people from 100 countries come together and all pray in their own language at the same time to realize that God is the God not just of Brazil, but he's the God of the whole world. And when you see these people all throughout the world come together and pray in Christ, it will melt, melt your heart. It's also fun to see the Israelis and Palestinians fellowshipping together, Indians and Pakistanis, the Russians and Ukrainians. When they come together and they start to, to fellowship, you see what Jesus can do. I was at a conference several years ago, and uh, it was in Cyprus. We had people from the Mideast countries, and I was standing with an Egyptian general and there was an Israeli soldier, and the three of us were talking. In the far corner of the room, there was another Israeli with a Palestinian policeman. And the Israeli soldier, we were talking about the problems in the Mideast and how confusing it is. And the Israeli said this, he said, the problem in the Mideast is so complicated and has so many feelings that it is impossible to come up with a solution that won't make things even worse. No human mind can solve this problem, but God's wisdom can. And we wait and for God to come back and give us the solution. But until he comes back, until Jesus comes back, 
Then he pointed to this Israeli and Palestinian. He said, until Jesus comes back, that is our only hope. People coming together in Christ. And the Egyptian general said, yes. An Egyptian general said to the Israeli, he said, all my life I was taught to hate you and your people. But now that I see you as a brother in Christ, I can no longer look on you or your people the same way. So if you think about it, by getting military people from all over the world together, it has a chance to change the world in many, many ways. So we're very excited that there's a possibility that, um, that Brazil, UMSEBI, which is the national thing, that they may decide we would like to offer to host it. So we'll pray about that, and we'll pray as Brazil prays that that would happen. Coronel, para a gente encerrar, o que, que o senhor achou dessa visita aqui no Brasil? Oh, we love Brazil. But Brazil is a big country like the United States. Some people say, oh, uh, I was in New York. That's the United States. No, it's not the United States. It's just a part. And we're here just, we're Sao Paulo. We go to Brasilia, Recife, Fortaleza. We've seen many pieces of the country. But we love Brazil because you have, God has blessed it so much. We see so much God is doing. We see so much potential in Brazil. And this trip, especially, it has been a joy because we have received wonderful hospitality. And we see the love of Christ at churches, uh, in the military fellowship, among the chaplains. And we see God bringing together as one in Christ all these different people in Brazil. And I know you may not feel the same because the people in the country always feel it's the worst, but we see much hope and many things that are very promising here in Brazil. So when we come down, it is always an encouragement to us and I hope to the people that we meet with here in Brazil. Okay. Coronel, in nome de todos os militares e policiais do Brasil, Eu queria agradecer a visita do senhor no nosso país, agradecer o trabalho que o senhor tem feito, dizer que está sendo, para mim, particularmente, muito edificante conhecer o senhor, é uma inspiração para nós, e que Deus abençoe o senhor, a sua família e tudo que o senhor tem feito de bom. Oh, well, thank you, but thank you also for all of your hospitality. And may God bless you and God bless Brazil. Amém. Amém. É isso aí, pessoal. Continue acompanhando nossos vídeos, dá um like aí, divulga e curta nosso canal. Valeu!